This lecture is about adaptation, and there's a reason that we are devoting an entire lecture to the concept of adaptation. It is a problematic issue because it is often invoked and not nearly as frequently critically investigated as it is invoked. In other words, people have a tendency to leap to the conclusion that some condition is an adaptation. That is not necessarily true and it can lead to incorrect inference. So we are going to talk about why adaptation is problematic and how we can recognize it. Adaptation is sort of the central character in just so stories. That means these are scenarios that are made up by people who have learned about evolution and in those stories they are often coupling their interpretation to ima an imaginary environment in the evolutionary past that has just exactly the characteristics that are needed to make their favorite hypothesis plausible. That is really the reason why the critique of adaptation arose, because this was seen to be an invalid and biased way of making arguments. Claims of adaptation, therefore, should not be accepted unexamined. Any hypothesis of adaptation needs to be tested against alternatives. You'll notice in the series of lectures, we've already had one good hypothesis that's an alternative, and that is that it evolved for random reasons. It was neutral, and that's always something to keep in the back of your mind. Evolutionary biologists have been worried about this problem and they have developed a set of criteria by which one can recognize an adaptation. Here are the most important. The first is natural selection itself. That means you actually observe the process and you can see what parts of the change occurred because of it. Second, you perturb the state of the organism somehow and through that perturbation you demonstrate that the state that it's in has more reproductive success than the alternatives. Third, there is a functional definition. Fourth, there is a design definition. And fifth, there is an invasion resistance way of recognizing adaptation. So we will step through these in a bit more detail. Natural selection. So, natural selection exists when there's a correlation between variation in the trait and variation in reproductive success. And natural selection is what is thought to produce adaptations. The idea here is that you observe the process. If you see then that there's a response to natural selection, well, that must mean that some of the variation in the trait is heritable. And if you then document changes in the trait that are resulting from a demonstrated correlation of the state of that trait with reproductive success, you have observed the process of adaptation produce the state of adaptation. This has been done many times with experimental evolution. And in fact, if you do this, you really don't need the concept of adaptation anymore. You have so much detail on the process that you don't need to invoke some sort of past environment. You actually saw the thing happen. And in that case, the state of the trait that has been caused by the process of selection is an adaptation. The second criterion is the perturbation criterion. Now this requires that you've got a predictive model and an experiment. By predictive model I mean a good reason well thought out to expect that the trait ought to be in that state. Sometimes it's a mathematical model, sometimes it's a verbal model with good logic. An adaptation under this criterion is the state of a trait that's been predicted. You have tested that idea by perturbing the phenotype from its optimal state, and you've demonstrated that the fitness of the perturbed phenotypes is lower than the fitness of the predicted one. This is not easy to do. It has been done by ornithologists. It's been done by herpetologists with various kinds of traits. Let's select one. This is Sergi Don's experiment together with uh, a couple of colleagues on kestrels. What they did was they manipulated the number of babies that the kestrels had to raise. Here is one of their key results. 
they either reduced the number of eggs in a kestrel nest, or they took some out and put the same number back, that was their control, or they enlarged the nests. Here you can see the number of broods, and here you can see how large those nests were. So kestrels lay a number of eggs, and they tend to lay about five. Now, the mean change in brood size was in the reduced nests, it was almost two offspring fewer, and in the increased nests, it was about two and a half offspring more. Now, if you just go through the number of babies that flew out of those nests, it looks like those birds should have been laying more eggs. The reduced clutches produced about three, the control about five, and the enlarged nests produce about seven. Interestingly, the biologists that were doing this watched how hard the birds were working and they could determine by using doubly labeled water experiments that it was actually costing them a lot of energy to take care of the enlarged broods. And they were not spending as much time foraging when they only had fewer babies to take care of. That had a consequence. The consequence was that the local survival of the parents was better for the small broods than it was for the enlarged ones. 65% of these birds made it through to have babies the next year, and only 43% of the enlarged brood, of the birds with enlarged broods made it through. What that meant is that they had different reproductive values. So the reproductive value of a clutch means that there were this many coming out of the clutch, and the reproductive value of a parent means how many more babies could it expect in the rest of its lifetime if some particular thing had happened to it. So the ones that had reduced clutches could expect 10 more, and the ones that had enlarged clutches could only expect about six and a half more. The result of that is that the control birds were expecting about 14 per lifetime, the reduced about 13, and the increased about 13 and a half. That is a very interesting result. This is carried out over a number of generations. The study took about 10 years. When we think about it, what it means is that these control birds were laying the right number of eggs for their particular conditions. If they had laid fewer, they would have fewer children, and if they had laid more, they would have fewer children per lifetime. This is really a lovely way to demonstrate that the number of eggs laid by a bird is optimal. Perturb it and look at the differences plus or minus and you find out that fitness goes down if you perturb it either way. The third way that we recognize adaptation is the so-called functional criterion and it is based on a change in the phenotype. We owe it to both George Williams and to Eberhard Curio and they defined one way of recognizing an adaptation as an appropriate plastic response. That would mean that an adaptation is a change in a phenotype that occurs in response to a specific environmental signal. It has a clear functional relationship to that signal. In other words, there's a good reason to think that it is improving survival or reproduction. And otherwise, it doesn't appear. Now that will happen when this change is costly. In other words, if it costs you something, you're only going to do it when there is a clear reason to do so. Here are some co convincing cases. The water flea Daphnia produces spines and helmets when it encounters dissolved molecules that are associated with predators. And the efficiency of the predators in eating Daphnia is reduced by the spines and the helmets. You can show the Daphnia that make spines and helmets have fewer babies, so they have a reproductive cost, and they're not produced when there aren't any predators around. Barnacles grow in a way that bends their shells over if there are snails in the environment. The barnacles can smell the presence of snails, basically by smelling their urine, and that reduces the fecundity of the barnacles. In other words, if there are no snails around, grow straight and have more babies. If there are snails around, grow bent over, have fewer babies, but survive better. 
And then another very interesting example is that a snail which would be parasitized by a digenetic trematode, a worm, in this case it's schistosomiasis, uh, will reproduce earlier if that is a worm that might castrate it. A little bit about castrating parasites. The reason that some wor uh, worms and some bacteria castrate their hosts is that that keeps the host from investing in making babies and makes the host grow larger so that there's more flesh for the parasite to use to make its babies. That's why there are so many castrating parasites. Here is a, uh, a graph from that study of schistosomiasis. So in this, it's a very interesting case because in this case the snails, which are, are the organism that's reacting, were just exposed to water in which the trematodes had been held. So they smelled the presence of the trematodes, but they weren't actually infected by them. And they were, they were sort of having a shock reaction. They said, oh my goodness, I might get castrated. What should I do? Well, here we have the weeks after they were exposed to the trematodes. Here we have the mean number of eggs that they are laying per day. This solid line is the set for the exposed snails and the dashed line for the unexposed controls. Basically what you see is that they shift their reproduction earlier in life. In other words, they try to get the babies out before they will be castrated and lose their ability to reproduce. That's an adaptation. Then we approach the criteria for adaptation, which uh, deals with the design concept. And this business of design in nature is one of the things that evolution explains. And the ability of natural selection to produce the appearance of design is actually one of its deepest results. This uh, was a, basically a debate started by William Paley and then refined, uh, who didn't believe in natural selection, but certainly saw a lot of design in nature. And it was then developed by George Williams, John Maynard Smith, and George Lauder. Adaptation in the, under this criterion can be recognized by complexity, conformity to design specifications. That would be something like it's not only complex, it's really precise. And in that sense, it resembles something that an engineer might design. Any complex organ performing a difficult function efficiently meets this criterion. The vertebrate eye, which is a beautiful camera, in most respects, meets this criterion. Now, George Lauder said that there are a bunch of questions we ought to pose before we accept that this is the case. One is, has anybody done any experiments that support the function? Has the performance of that trait in doing that task been compared with other alternative states of the trait? So are we really sure that it's the best possible state of the trait? If we look comparatively with related species, in other words, if we do a phylogenetic analysis, does that suggest that the state that is claimed to be an adaptation is repeatedly associated with the kind of natural selection needed to produce it. In other words, every time that organisms come onto land, do they develop an impermeable skin? Every time that plants come onto land, do they develop a waxy cuticle? That would be an example of something happening repeatedly. Another is, could the trait have been selected as a byproduct of selection on other traits? And that would mean, are we actually focusing on the, th on the thing that we should be trying to explain? Or is it, are we seeing it just because it's connected to something else? And then fifth, is it a spandrel? A spandrel is a feature in architecture where at the corner of a room or a cathedral or something like that, there is a particular space which is created on the ceiling and that is just a byproduct of the construction process. It's, a spandrel is essentially a byproduct. In a sense, it's an example, a specific example of the fourth condition. So if you want to claim that something's an adaptation, you need to check whether it might be a spandrel. So is that an inappropriate abstraction of a piece of the organism out of the whole in which it's naturally embedded. 
One of the possible spandrels in our body is the chin. The chin uh, of an adult human basically results when the face over our development becomes a bit flatter. And there are reasons why our face becomes flatter. It has to do probably with social communication and the way we use our eyes and things like that. But that causes the chin to emerge as a more prominent part of our features. So does that need to be explained, or do we just regard that as a byproduct of the developmental process? The fifth criterion is a more theoretical one, and it comes out of game theory. And that is the ESS, Evolutionarily Stable Strategy, or Invasion Resistance Criterion. And this is a way of testing, and it's usually done in a uh, mathematical or uh, a computer model, a simulation, but it can be done experimentally. It's a way of thinking about a population where you have a trait that is your candidate for adaptation and you want to know if it's really an adaptation. So to test that, you allow the population to be systematically and repeatedly invaded by all possible alternative states of the trait. So basically you bombard it with anything that might outcompete it. And if your candidate adaptation can resist invasion by alternative states, then we say it's an adaptation in the sense that it's a strategy that resists invasion. This is actually a very strong logical criterion, but it's a bit easier to carry out in a model than it is experimentally. Um, it could be done with viruses or bacteria in an experimental research program. There are some cases that are not covered by that. For example, we have situations in which A beats B beats C beats A. That leads to eternal cycles. These just kind of churn forever. It can be that the state that resists all invaders is not attainable. In other words, uh, there's no way to get here from there. If you start at low frequency, you're never going to be able to actually invade a population and get to the point where you can then resist invasion. There can be negative frequency dependence. That means that the more frequent the thing in the population, the less fit it is, and the less frequent it is, the more fit it is. That means when it gets rare, it's going to rebound, and when it gets frequent, it's going to crash. So that can yield an adaptive set of phenotypes. It'll end up with a mixture, but it won't be a single best adapted phenotype. And then there are cases where the invasion challenge is hard to arrange, the ability to resist has not been convincingly tested, in other words, this is a criterion which is nice as an abstract principle. It helps us to think clearly, but it's not something that's, that's easily implemented and easily checked uh, in the real world. So, the summary on adaptation. Natural selection is the best. If we see it, we know it happened. The perturbation criterion is convincing. The functional criterion of Williams and Curio, that is, you see the plastic response that only occurs when it's useful, the induced responses are pretty convincing. The design criterion is plausible if Lauder's questions can be answered, they can't always be, and the invasion resistance criterion is only as good as the variants that are tried in any practical uh, real world case. So. The bottom line is that adaptation is only problematic if it's not tested or testable, and one should beware untestable claims of adaptation.